Dear Professor, thank you very much that you agreed to have this interview. Uh, I have a question. You have an experience in research what is corruption. Mm -hmm. Could you please define in general what it is, this phenomenon? I guess the most general definition would be <clears throat> a perception that things are not right. Right. So the broadest use of the term corruption is when the system just stops working the right way. And, and in English, we, we use the word corruption, for example, for a, a computer program that stops working the right way. We say that program has been corrupted, right? The definition, I mean, that definition is, is, is fine, but it's not useful for someone who's trying to study corruption or someone who's trying to control corruption. So in the social sciences, the, the, the um, non-ethics, non-theological study of corruption, most social scientists use a definition that's more precise, and that definition is the misuse or abuse of a position of trust or authority for personal benefit rather than for the reason that trust or authority was given to someone. And that definition would include things like bribery, things like nepotism, things like embezzlement, things like state theft of state-owned property. And then there's a definition that's kind of in between the broad definition and the more precise definition. And that definition is undue influence. So cronyism. Um, I give you a job, not because you give me a bribe, but because we're closely related. I give you a contract, not because you gave me a bribe, but because I know that we're part of the same group and you'll, you know, you'll do me some favors kind later soft, on. Soft, soft corruption. But yeah, exactly, exactly. All of these are definitions that are used, but, but the precise definition allows us to study, to measure, to, to do things a bit more scientifically. We don't want to ignore the soft definition though. According to the um, sociology, mm -hmm. if you ask people what is the biggest problem in Ukraine, corruption will be on the first and the second place, sure. probably the first place, and people want to change it. Sure. Where should people seek for the remedy? What could be a recipe to overcome corruption? So, this is not this is not an answer that someone who's angry right now wants to hear. But the 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 first step is usually trying to understand corruption, because we all have, you know, kind of our own personal reaction. And we all have our personal experience, but our own reaction and our own experience don't necessarily take us to the, the, the root causes of corruption or the, the structures that allow corruption to exist. So if, if the Ukrainian people, and I use that term generally and I don't mean to, to diminish anything, are really serious about corruption, um, the first step is really understanding it. Uh, but then after that, there's, there's something, it goes by different names, political will, for example, or social will, or social motivation. But th there's the, 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 the willingness to work together to directly confront the problem. In some countries like India, for example, People are very angry about corruption, and they should be. Corruption is very damaging to India. But it, it's difficult because it's such a big country and such a diverse country to get a lot of people working together and willing to commit directly to confront, or to confront directly this phenomenon. And, and in small countries like South Korea, 
uh, um, like some countries in Central America, Panama, for example, much easier to get that 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 desire that that we're willing to work together to directly confront this problem. So first, patience, understand it, and second, commitment, actually do something. After that, there's not really much of a formula because every place is different, and and what people in Ukraine need to do is going to be different than what people in Poland need to do. And what people in Poland need to do is much different than what people in Vanuatu need to do. Right? Every place is different socially, every place is different structurally. And you need to work with what you've got and you need to work with the actual problem that faces that polity. Uh, according to the same sociology, it seems that there is another problem how to cope with uh, corruption. Uh, many people say that they want to stop corruption, sure. but they don't want to begin with themselves. <laughs> they often sure. claim, well, my corruption is yeah. very small. It's about a box of chocolate or small amount of money that I give to some uh, state officer or I yeah. give to some medical doctor, but they are on the top of the society in the yeah. high offices. There is a huge corruption. Let's first stop corruption there, then we will stop it down on our level. Yeah. How to do with this? So that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> And it, 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 I love that question because it's very observant and because it also, it, 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 it's kind of on the cutting edge of our understanding of corruption. In, Engl in the English language, there's a phenomenon, there's a phenomenon that in the English language is called moral neutralization. And that is the, what you just described. When, when people engage in any kind of bad behavior, but it doesn't register as bad to them. So for example, I, I have to work, you know, 15 hours a day, seven days a week to complete a project. I may steal a laptop and say, well, you know, the firm isn't paying me for all this extra work. I deserve this laptop. And it doesn't register in my head as stealing a laptop, but it's still stealing. And we see that sometimes with corruption. You know, oh, I have to do this because it's the way it's done. I have to do this because I want to feed my family. You know, there's all these excuses that people make in their heads um, to neutralize the, 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 the guilt or the, uh, another phrase is psychic costs of this bad behavior. And so one, and, and this is true of business ethics in general, one way to counter moral neutralization is to teach people that this phenomenon happens and, and that they're thinking in a, in, a, in a bad way and they're not thinking properly. And by bad, I don't mean, you know, in a morally bad way. I mean that their thinking just isn't coherent. It doesn't make sense. It's bad thought process. And, and interestingly, when we teach people that, that they're prone to thinking in these particular ways, it actually reduces the amount of moral neutralization that occurs. And again, this is true not just of corruption, but of all kinds of ethical lapses. And in my field, it's business ethics, but of all kinds of ethical lapses. So even asking the question that you just asked, helps to, to begin to reduce the amount of moral neutralization that occurs. And you're absolutely correct. Um, moral and in some places, this phenomenon of moral neutralization can be one of the leading causes of corruption, um, particularly when people in a, in, a, in a judicial system can excuse their behavior to themselves because judges are often independent. The, and, and, and the kind of moral or ethical rules that, that 
that bound their behavior are even more important. Or in government systems where there's not a lot of political accountability. Moral, moral neutralization can be a really serious cause of corruption. Okay, this corruption on the high level offices, or let's say it, let's call it institutional corruption, okay. um, it is seen by the majority of people as the biggest threat to the existence of the state as such, sure. to the existence of Ukraine. And uh, if you look back to the results of Orange Revolution, mm -hmm. see some a sort of reforms succeeded. Mm -hmm. Let's say we have no more corruption to enter the universities. That's great. And that was a change of rules. After the uh, revolution of dignity, mm -hmm. we changed, reformed uh, traffic police. No bribery on the road. Good, yeah. But it was a reform, the regulation, and everyone was dismissed and yeah. completely new people were uh, welcomed, yeah, yeah. trained, yeah. and well, this changed. And many people, when they say that let's start the fight against corruption from the institutional level, they mean mainly this thing, but you mentioned the political will yeah. to do this. Yeah. But very often this political will needs uh, foreign incentives so from so our so. partners yeah. because otherwise, and it is also the people who says this according to the sociology, we need this foreign support to combat this uh, co institutional corruption. But then other people says, look, but in this case, Ukraine appears to be ruled by foreign countries. This is called foreign rule. Sure. And there are two problems, foreign rule and interior corruption. How to resolve this problem? Ukraine would not be alone in having a lot of people who don't want foreign influence. And then and th and there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that we live in a world today where the concept of foreign is much less crisp. Um, it, it, it's much, th there's a blurring of the lines that separate countries and cultures and polities. Um, I'm from I, I I'm from the United States. In the United States, a very um, prominent car manufacturer is called Ford. Ford Automobile. Um, Ford Automobile has plants and interests in 130 countries, and their most famous vehicle, a, a F. 150 pickup truck has more foreign parts than a Toyota Camry, which in, in theory is a Japanese company. Um, if what happens in Japan very much affects Ford, and what Ford does very much affects Indonesia. Uh, the food that I eat, uh, my favorite food is sushi from Japan. Um, my children play video games from all over the world. Uh, you, you know, the, the, this concept of us, 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 us doesn't really make sense to business people. Um, business people don't think in terms of countries, they think in terms of networks, right? And so, you know, t foreign influence on the United States, foreign influence on Ukraine, foreign influence on any country, that's, that's the way the world is right now. And it is, it, there's a lot of advantages to that. But, uh, but of course, I, I understand, particularly in a country like Ukraine, that has been dominated by so many different 
other powers in the region, that you'd want to be careful with that. So there's ways to leverage foreign influence that are natural and, and beneficial. The, the United Kingdom Bribery Act, UK Bribery Act, is a very powerful incentive for businesses not to engage in corruption in Ukraine. Because a business that engages in corruption in Ukraine can't do business in any, anything that the United Kingdom touches or is subject to criminal penalties. And that's a lovely foreign influence for Ukraine to take advantage of. Because all of the, the, the network that businesses think about that, that, a, that a business would use in Ukraine, they want them to not engage in corruption. Because if they are related to that network, they can't do business in the United Kingdom. So that's a, that's a great foreign influence that shouldn't threaten people in Ukraine when we talk about foreign influences. Right? There's also the fact that, with all due respect to Ukraine, and Ukraine seems to be a very lovely place, there are polities, countries, and other political units that have more experience in dealing with or combating corruption. And Ukraine can learn from them. Ukraine shouldn't copy them, and Ukraine shouldn't say, okay, you take over things. But Ukraine can learn from them. And that kind of foreign influence is a great influence. It's, it's learning, it's taking advantage of, it's, it's taking what's best from different places. Um, but that too can be controlled by Ukraine. You just leverage off of it, you just borrow from it, you use it. So I totally understand, given Ukraine's history, this concern. But I, I don't think it's a concern that should take people away from all of the great things that are out there all over the world that Ukraine could benefit from. Okay, thank you very much. And a concluding question, maybe the most complex question. <laughs> um, we have a social will to combat corruption. The, social, uh, the civil society is mature enough just to force, let's say, the authority to do something in order to reduce corruption or to combat it uh, completely. Uh, but on the other hand, the so, uh, civil society is not mature enough in order to create political parties mm -hmm. which will be effective, efficient. And the reason for this is that at the end of 90s, a new business elite was born, new tycoons, yeah. whom we used to call oligarchs, who became tycoons because they had relationship, close relationship to local or national authority. Yeah. And now they are so strong as to have huge businesses, which cost billions of dollars. They owe media. They have their political parties, they control these parties, and in order to create a new party, you should be present on TV channels. But in order to be present on TV channels, you have to get some relationships with owner of these TV channels, and the owner are oligarchs. And it looks like their power is very concrete, is cemented. They owe everything. And in order to reduce their power, we need a national legislation reform, the deregulation, decentralization, but the political will of oligarchs is something different than political will of the civil society. Yeah. That is a, like a vicious cycle. The situation is not hopeless. Um, believe it or not, I, 
I would use this example no matter where I was from. I happened to be from the United States. But the United States was in the same position in the, 18, the late 1800s, um, particularly after, after the massive industrialization of the United States, the, rail, the railway system in particular. Um, the United States had tycoons, uh, the Carnegies, right, the, the Rockefellers, etc. Uh, the U.S. government was very corrupt. The President Grant was symbolic of this, but the, there were lots of other, I mean, it was very corrupt. And the tycoons controlled media, at that time newspapers. And yet, by the 1910s or so, um, that control had almost vanished. And, and it, it was in the hands of the people and the government started becoming much cleaner. And the, 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 the things to keep in mind, and of course the experience of the United States is not what Ukraine should do. Uh, Ukraine's gonna do what Ukraine does. But, it, but it's, it's important to know that these situations are not hopeless, that they change, and they, change, they can change for the better, right? So, for example, the, the control over media. Well, you know, all over the world right now, uh, not all over the world, but all over much of the world that has modern technology, the, the grip of, of television is evaporating. My students can't watch a half-hour television show. They're so accustomed to watching five minutes, 10 minutes on their, on their mobile devices. And we know from experiences in North America, in Western Europe, to some extent in Eastern Europe, in, in um, the, the um, Northern Africa, to some extent the Middle East, that, that these, these much more abbreviated and, and much more disparate forms of social media can influence far more than television and print media. And so political parties in Ukraine have that opportunity in front of them. We know that, that, that tycoons, that oligarchs, you know, that, that in the United States they were called robber barons in the 1880s, that their grip on power, it, it seems tight, but it's actually somewhat fragile. And it's fragile for two reasons. One is the relationship between politicians and business people, which it, it right now seems very meshed. They, they're almost the same people and government is controlled by business. But structurally, the politicians have, have independence. And that, that structural independence can always be reasserted. So there's that fragility. But there's also the fragility of, of people I and mean, we've seen really extreme examples of people lashing out against the tight relationship between business and government. And this part of the world, you know, saw the revolutions in St. Petersburg when thousands of people marched on the streets and said, this has to change. I'm not predicting an extreme change like that. I'm certainly not expecting, <laughs> but, but there is always this pressure from the people and, and we've seen it erupting a lot lately. In, in Egypt, you know, it, it erupted and was crushed, but it, latently it's still there. In Iraq, it's erupting. In Lebanon, it's erupting, right? Um, in parts of Eastern Europe, parts of Central Europe, it's erupting in Southeast Asia, in South Asia. And, and, and it makes the, it, at first, business and government makes their grip even tighter, but, but the, the pressure from the people can drive a wedge in between business and government. And so business, a smart, a smart tycoon, a smart oligarch, a smart robber baron says, I have to change. I have to run my business in a way that doesn't just benefit me. I have to run my business in a way that's accountable not just to me, but to the government and to the people. And so it changes. Now, it may be an abrupt change, 
but hopefully it will be a, a change that everyone works in, the, the business people, government, and the civil society. That's when you get the smoothest, most productive, most beneficial for everybody kind of change. It's happened before and it, it will, I'm, I'm not here to say it's gonna happen in Ukraine, but there's every reason to believe it could happen in Ukraine and every reason to believe it will happen in Ukraine precisely because of the revolutions and the, the protest movements that you mentioned and because Ukraine is so closely, uh, you know, physically located to um, places that have gone through these changes already and because Ukraine is access to information from all over the world and is highly educated. So there's every reason to believe that the change will be the productive kind rather than the abrupt kind. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions.